Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll get cracking. Okay, so yeah, uh, thank you very much for coming and thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, your interest in learning from history and being the most effective animal advocates that we could be, and thanks very much to Animal International Open Cages and Care Conference for having me. Um, so, my name is Jamie Harris, I'm a researcher at the Think Tank Sentience Institute, and I have a, I did my undergraduate degree in history, um, but I've been kind of like volunteering for various organisations, in the meantime I've been working at Sentience Institute for about a year. Sentience Institute's work focuses on expanding the evidence base for uh, expanding humanity's moral circle, and so this is with a kind of like focus on the long ter long term future and how we can um, expand compassion for farmed animals, for wild animals, for potential sentient beings in the future. But in the meantime, this has a lot of overlap with the interests of farmed animal advocates who are focusing on making change now. Um, and we essentially a lot of our research helps farmed animal advocates think about how they can have the most impact that they can. Oh yeah, so I'm going to be talking about this question of what can animal advocates learn from the history of past social movements and technologies. So I'm going to start with a single example from Great Britain, uh, 1791. There was, at this time, a boycott. 300,000, somewhere between 300,000 and 500,000 people were refusing to buy West Indian sugar. And so this was about putting pressure on the slave trade at the time. And this was encouraged through pamphlets and handing out pamphlets. And so, for example, one particular pamphlet sold nearly 70,000 copies in four months. And the boycott began in 1791, and the slave trade was abolished in 1807. And given that the slave trade had been ongoing since about uh, 1555, that 15, 16-year gap looks pretty short. And you might look at that and think, great, that was really quick change after that boycott began. So from this, we might take this lesson and think, great individual outreach, handing out leaflets, to encourage consumer boycotts seems to be a really effective method for encouraging change um, and changing the world. Um, and you can see that kind of potential comparison between vegan leafleting, vegan outreach, and the, the historical precedent there from the British anti-slavery movement. But this is a bit of a misleading lesson. This is not what our executive director Kelly found when she conducted some in-depth research into the British anti-slavery movement. Uh, this is a screenshot from our research report, which is freely available on our website. So, yeah, so some of the reasons why this seems to be a bit misleading. So, as I said, 300,000 to 500,000 people were, was, were participating in this boycott, but that was only about 46% of the population of Great Britain. Um, those people probably had an outsized impact because the, uh, the amount of sales of sugar from the colonies actually dropped by a third to a half in that time. So even though it was only a tiny proportion of the of people who were actually boycotting it, uh, it was the people who were buying most of the sugar uh, because the kind of like consumption and purchasing of sugar was so unevenly distributed in society at that time. So it's not like just getting this small number of people manages to increase, uh, we can necessarily infer from that that having that small number of people boycotting sugar was a really successful thing. It was because it had such a big impact on the total consumption. Um, it, it was also different because it was much more targeted as a boycott than veganism is as a boycott. This is because uh, sugar was one import from slavery. It was the largest import, sure, but it was uh, slaves also produced tobacco, cotton, and these other products, and those were not boycotted at the time. This was a kind of single symbolic focus of boycotting against uh, the products from slavery. So that's another difference. Women were, most of the participants were women, and at this time, women had very little other forms of activism or engagement in kind of like political processes that they had available to them. So women couldn't vote, they couldn't be elected, uh, and this was in some ways, this was probably the best opportunity for women to get engaged in encouraging change, was actually do something that they could do as consumers. So that's another difference. And, and I think a really important difference is that this was a really short-lived campaign. It began in 1791, it peaked in 1792, the following year, and it kind of petered out after that. Um, and there was another attempt after the slave trade itself was banned, uh, but it certainly wasn't this long-term, gradual, building more and more people boycotting. It was a quick, kind of like, let's make a big change, uh, big symbolic attack on the institution of slavery. And really, really importantly, this was one tool aimed at wider institutional change. This was aimed at longer term goals. So to put it in context, um, there had been a vote the previous year against, for the abolition of the slave trade in the UK Parliament, and that vote didn't pass. Um, but there was also another vote the following year 
where that passed through the House of Commons, which is half of the UK Parliament, but did not pass through the House of Lords. So this was very much in the middle of these political campaigns, and it was about putting pressure on the institution of slavery at the time. Um, there was also various other types of interventions, like there was a petition that gathered 390,000 signatures, you know, which is somewhere in the range of the number of people involved in the boycott as well. Um, so the boycott wasn't the goal in itself. The boycott was part of this wider pressure for institutional change, and that's a key difference. So yeah, what I'm getting at is that there's all these differences, and so looking at it, you can't just kind of can't kind of say, oh, that form of individual outreach worked, and therefore we should copy that tactic. It's not as simple a lesson as that, because there's all these differences. And so this is a good example of the kind of dilemma that animal advocates face when they're using historical evidence. On the one hand, this is great form of evidence, we can look at historical evidence and say, yeah, there's definitely lessons that can be learned from that. Uh, and there's potential for all these strategic insights from these various social movements that have ex existed in the past and the hundreds of years of history that we can study. But on the other hand, these case studies can be misleading and they can lead us down the, uh, the kind of the wrong path if we place too much weight on certain types of evidence. And so this will be, this is discussed in a bit more depth in a post on Sentience Institute's website called What Can the Farmed Animal Movement Learn from History? But I'm gonna share some of the content and some of the kind of insights from that post in the rest of this talk. Uh, yeah, just a quick note that whenever I have a screenshot like this with the kind of white and the blue and our logo, that's a post on our website and all of this information is freely available online so you can just go to the website to look it up in more detail if you're interested. Okay, so yeah, talking about that kind of dilemma, I focus a bit now on the risks of using historical evidence. So, one risk is that it's easy to incorrectly infer causation, look at something and say, A happened, then B happened after it, so A must have caused B, um, and that's not necessarily how it works. There are lots of factors in that time space between A and B happening, and it, quite often it could be misleading to assume that there's a connection there. They could be completely unrelated. Um, yeah, so that's one, one concern. Another difficulty with looking at historical evidence is because there's so much information out there, we can kind of pick things and say, ah, I've already got this view and here's something which seems to support that, so I'm going to focus on that and say, look, there's this historical precedent for this kind of intervention or whatever, and that's certainly a risk and it's, it's hard to avoid, even as when you're conducting in-depth case studies, um, it's very easy to go into it with particular ideas, particular hypotheses, and then find that evidence. And certainly historians uh, can sort of misrepresent how, how things have panned out, whether that's intentionally or not. So that's certainly a risk. Another concern about historical evidence is that random error could explain why some movements stick out to us. So if we assume that there are lots of potential social movements, there's hundreds, and um, there's lots of different factors that cause success or failure, and some of those ones that seem to have been successful could just be they got lucky. Um, it could be there was just a combination of different long-term trends that worked out in their favour. And so if we then look at those random ones that just happen to get lucky and do really well, and we try and think, what caused that to be successful? It could be that there's nothing meaningful there, and we're just like guessing at essentially just random error. Another downside is that historians rarely ever agree with each other, uh, even on where there's been lots of study, for examples are the French Revolution or World War I. Um, they don't tend to, it's not like the more historians write about it, the more and more confident we come, they come quite often, it makes us less confident because they challenge those previous ideas. So it's not like there's one clear historical truth that we can come to, uh, because these questions are really difficult, and working out causation from uh, limited evidence is, is really hard. So as an example from the French Revolution, um, there was initially a lot of emphasis on kind of Marxist historical explanations, where there was talking about the growth of the bourgeoisie, the middle class, and how they challenged the aristocracy and were pushed onwards by the working class. And that was kind of seen as a key explanation for change. But the kind of main criticism of this is what's called the revisionist school of his historians who emphasise these other factors like court, court politics and financial and structural factors. Um, in World War I, there's a similar story of where if you look at different decades of kind of the, the past 60 years, uh, views have changed a lot over that time. Uh, at one point there was, in the kind of 1920s, historians were saying no one country was to blame. Uh, there was just all these various factors like nationalism, the alliance system, and we should kind of hold no country to blame in that sense. In about the 1960s, 70s, 
uh, new wave of historians came along and said actually Germany was kind of being too aggressive and it was expansion from them that caused World War, World War I. And then more recently historians have kind of gone back and said uh, actually no, no one's to blame, it's due to random, random chance and these various other factors. And so it's different from the historians in the 1920s but there's some agreement and you can just see from these two examples that it's really hard to kind of there's no reason really to think now that we've come to the answer much more confidently than say 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And so historians rarely agree. And so it's, I guess the point here is that being confident about what caused what from, the, from history is really hard. Um, and we shouldn't overemphasize our confidence in those conclusions. So you might be thinking, okay, we can't be very confident on particular case studies. It's really hard to understand that. But can we just look at where there have been various correlations from lots of different movements that have had some similarities? And there has been some systematic research like this. But again, there are problems with this. So one example of a problem with this kind of systematic research is it's sometimes weak comparability to the farmed animal movement. So we can't just say, so the context is different, the meaning is different. Um, so yeah, an example there is that book uh, in the middle there, Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan, how, sorry, why civil resistance works. They looked at hundreds of social movements, they looked at 323 different resistance campaigns um, and looked for various correlations, were there any features that helped to explain success. And it's a fascinating book, very interesting. Uh, but the campaigns were focused on territorial goals, regime changes, it was like kicking out governments, uh, those sorts of big goals which seem in a lot of ways very different to the animal advocacy movement. And an example of the finding they found was that um, there was a very high correlation between the police and the military forces switching sides and going over to the protesters and that causing change. And that you can see how that would be important for regime change, but maybe not so important for the farmed animal movement or other forms of animal advocacy. So they could be they can be kind of incomparable in some ways. Another problem with this kind of systematic research for animal advocates is that it can have these kind of misleading inclusion criteria. So another, another great book, great piece of research, The Strategy of Social Protest by William Gamson, uh, that had a sample of 53 American groups from 1800 to 1945. But the question, and there's some really interesting correlations there, but the question is what's been missed out? There's only 53 groups, they were ones that kind of reached a certain level, and you might say, you might say oh look, 80% of successful groups from this sample had this particular characteristic, but maybe 80% of the groups that didn't even make it into the sample because they were so small and failed had the exact same characteristic. Um, and so sometimes, uh, actually what makes it into the study can be misleading. But even so, I still think there's things to learn from those, those two studies, uh, those bits of research. Another problem is just that it's rare that we have this kind of systematic research. Uh, if you know of examples that aren't those two that you think are really useful for animal advocates, please tell me because I probably don't know about it. Um, yeah, so what are the solutions then? And can, can we still learn from things from history? The answer is very much yes. How can we get around these problems? So one uh, technique we can use is to focus on the most comparable case studies. We say, these are the features of animal advocates and the animal advocacy movement. Are there other movements which are more similar to the animal advocacy movement that we can kind of be more confident probably will apply in our case as well? So at Census Institute, we talk a lot about this criteria of ally-based movements. And by ally-based, we mean this is kind of uh, people advocating for other beings that aren't themselves or other humans or another, uh, yeah, just something else to, to look out for. So this would include things like the environmental movement. This might include even things like the anti-abortion movement because they're advocating for fetuses. Um, this wouldn't include things like the civil rights movement because that's about a minority group kind of advocating for better rights and protections for itself. Um, so that's just one factor that might make the kind of drawing lessons from the civil rights movement less comparable than say the environmental movement. Um, yeah, so you the idea is you focus on those studies and those, those historic examples that do seem more comparable. Another way we can try and improve our confidence in conclusions or that the evidence we're looking at will be helpful for animal advocates is we can try and work out what the counterfactors are. Basically what would have happened had this particular factor been different. And this is really hard to do and really hard to evaluate with any confidence again. Um, but trying to think about it and trying to understand it can help us be more confident in the conclusions. So as an example, in the environmental movement, there's a famous writer called Rachel Carson, writing in the 1960s. Um, we can kind of try and work, we can try and think about as confidently as possible if Rachel Carson had never existed or she'd never written that book, 
uh, how much difference would that really would have would that really have made, and therefore should we place that much emphasis on the importance of that kind of book writing? Uh, yeah, I think another important thing that we should do is just accept that it's really hard to be confident in particular judgments of causation, and we just have to bear that in mind. So we might say we think that this may have led to this, but maybe we're only like sixty percent confident, or. 40% confident that that change led to that, and therefore we shouldn't place too much weight on that particular uh, conclusion. Another thing we can do is, like I mentioned with systematic research, we can look for correlations and kind of repeated tactics or repeated examples of success or failure where possible and where we have enough information. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm now having talked about that kind of like the strengths and weaknesses of the evidence. I'll talk about some of the things we can actually learn and have learned from history. So one example of a really we can learn about some really big overarching questions like how tractable is changing the course of history? Like, is there actually anything we can do to shift humanity's trajectory towards more compassion or concern for animals or other sentient beings? And I would say that when I've looked at this, uh, the the kind of main conclusion that I found is that. <laughs> Um, obviously, there's a lot of scope for disagreement and like lots of evidence that you could use in this question. Uh, but yes, we can change the course of history, but it's really hard. <laughs> um, so one piece of evidence in this is I mentioned that book by William Gamson. Um, in that group of 53 social movement organizations that he studied, he found that, and again, remember that only some groups actually made it into the sample, and this is not every sort of person who sat in a room and thought, I'm going to change the world. This is only like 53 groups that actually made it into the sample. But, yeah, 49% of the groups that Gamson studied actually won what he called new advantages. And that is essentially like legislative changes, so changes in the law that actually made progress against that organization's goals. So obviously for our comparison would be, say, we want a new protection for animals or we want a new ban on something. Uh, it's that sort of thing. 47% uh, of them won acceptance, and that means kind of like institutions recognize them as a valid voice for the concern uh, that they were interested in. So those numbers are, in some ways, quite high. These are established organizations, but it, it shows that a decent number of organizations have actually managed to secure some change, right? Um, another example of some evidence from history here is we can look at examples of extremely influential writers and advocates. Um, you can think of, again, I mentioned Rachel Carson for environmentalism. You can think of Peter Singer for animal advocacy. Uh, you can think of Peter Singer and William McCaskill for effective altruism. Uh, various writers, you could even think of He's not a writer, I guess, but David Attenborough for like plastic straws. Uh, there's examples of people whose advocacy seems to have made a big impact and has been referenced lots of times and seems to have sparked change. Um, yeah, so I mentioned before, history also shows that this change can be really hard. So an example there is looking at the history of World War I, um, lots of change seems to have been like an important fa important factors in causing this change seems to have been down to short-term, really hard-to-influence factors. Um, so you can think of examples of negotiations that could have gone either way between superpowers, well, not superpowers, but important leaders. You can think of the assassination attempt on Franz Ferdinand um, in 1814, and that essentially was only, that very nearly failed, um, and was only successful because uh, Gavrilo Princip, the guy who actually killed Franz Ferdinand, had basically given up at that point, and the car just happened to be rerouted and then ended up in front of him, and then he managed to assassinate Franz Ferdinand. So you can see how luck plays a really important chance in determining some outcomes. And so this just suggests that changing history, the course of history can be hard and can be down to some things that are essentially outside of our control. But on the other hand, sometimes it's down to long-term indirect factors, which are also really hard to change. Um, the French Revolution shows some examples of that. Um, yeah, with things like long-term structural problems in the court and with finances in France. So getting on to some of the more specific stuff for animal advocacy, um, a single case study can provide weak evidence on a variety of questions. So this is a screenshot from our website, a summary of evidence for foundational questions in effective animal advocacy. Uh, if you take one thing from this talk and you look at one resource, this is definitely the thing I would recommend that you look at. It's essentially a summary of these various important questions that the animal advocacy movement faces, and we summarize the evidence for and against these various considerations, and I'll, um, it's obviously meant to be as neutral as possible, and all our research is intended to better understand and answer these questions. So yeah, I'll give a, I'll give a specific example in a second, so that'll make a bit more sense. 
Um, but yeah, I'll focus on this idea of a single case study providing insight into many questions, first of all. So I'll use the example of um, the US anti-abortion movement, which is a case study that I've been working on recently. This will be published, I assume, within the next few months because I finished the second draft of it. Um, yeah, obviously this is not showing support or even opposition to the goals of the movement. This is basically just looking at that movement for potential strategic insights, what has or hasn't worked. So one example of an insight from this movement is that encouraging legal change without popular support can provide momentum to a social movement's opponents. And so in 1973, there was the landmark Supreme Court decision of Roe v. Wade, which was essentially illegalized, no, sorry, wrong way around, <coughs> essentially made abortion legal up to the end of uh, what's called the first trimester of pregnancy in America. Um, after this, there was a big surge in social movement organization against abortion rights. So there was lots of anti-abortion advocacy that was encouraged by this kind of important symbolic development and this legal change. Um, and yeah, this, this just suggests that some, some legal change that maybe jumps ahead of public opinion, or even if it doesn't, could just spark a big opposition backlash. And this is just something we should be wary of. Um, you know, some organizations like the Non-Human Rights Project do advocate directly for legal change. They're litigating for animals to introduce ra uh, radical legal change. So this is a tactic which the animal advocacy movement is considering. Another example of a lesson from this movement is that legislation and direct action may, be effect may actually be effective at reducing the supply of services. So yeah, essentially there have been various there have been various social scientific analyses of the effectiveness of these different tactics that have been used in the anti-abortion movement. They do, they've done various forms of direct action and, and, and violence, um, and these things have not had a big impact on changing demand for abortion, but they do seem to have had a substantial impact on changing the supply of services, so they've disrupted uh, the provision of abortion. And the same is the case for various forms of legislation something called in America, especially in this decade, a surge in what's called targeted regulation of abortion providers. And there have been studies of these sorts of legislative change, and this has just made it really hard to access abortion um, in America. So an example was that in Texas, there was a, 2000, a law in 2004 that caused an 84% decrease in the number of abortions provided in Texas uh, for, a, for a period of time. Um, some, of that some of those abortions were carried out in other states, but it does show that supply of services can be disrupted. And so obviously we're thinking about the implications for animal advocates. It suggests that legislation and indeed direct action of suppliers of services, and this could be, um, you know, it could be slaughterhouses, it could be other forms of uh, supermarkets, it could be any kind of like provider of a service related to um, farmed animals, th th those services can be disrupted and successfully disrupted basically. Another example of a potential implication from this lesson, sorry, from this movement, is that close alignment with political or religious groups may be tractable. We, can, we, we could secure that, but it also potentially risks longer-term stagnation. So the anti-abortion movement has been very closely aligned with the Republican Party in America since 1980, but not before that, and very closely aligned with the evangelical religious community and the Catholic religious community in America Again, but there was a kind of turning point with the evangelical movement. And those, those were kind of changes that were introduced during the course of that, of that movement's history. But opinion on abortion in America has basically not changed since about 1973. It's basically said exactly the same. And although, again, remember I say that inferring causation is really difficult, and I can't, you know, I can't prove that uh, the political polarization was an important part of that lack of change, but I suspect that the... Um, the fact that the two, part, the two major parties were so divided on this issue has contributed to it being really hard to actually make change beyond a certain level because there's this constant pushback against any intervention that's tried by the abortion rights movement or the anti-abortion movement. So yeah, those are just some examples of some of the sorts of some of the sorts of lessons we can draw from a particular case study. And again, we shouldn't place too much confidence in those because this is that's um, again I'm not completely confident in even just inferring that that did happen in the anti-abortion movement, let alone that it would happen again if the farmed animal movement did it. Uh, but yeah so, yeah, so some of those examples we can be slightly more confident would apply. Um, but another way to look at this is just where we get a fairly consistent picture from several different movements. 
So I'll talk about this example. This is one of the foundational questions that we have summarized on our website of whether the animal advocacy movement should focus on interventions focus on individuals or interventions focus on institutions. So that's companies and governments. Um, and I suspect this is a kind of discussion that lots of you would have had in organizations or with friends or whatever. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about how social movement evidence applies to this question. So I mentioned earlier the British anti-slavery movement and with that boycott. There was this targeted boycott, uh, but it had this kind of political focus overall. And this seems to have been the boycott was, yes, used consumers, but targeted it at institutional change. Um, and it was that institutional change which was indeed secured. So yeah, I, inter I mean, that's, a, that's a kind of an uncertain one, but I interpret that as, ev as weak evidence of institutional change being more tractable than just kind of like building up consumer change. So uh, another example focused on slavery is the free produce, free produce movement in America um, from about the 1820s, anti kind of anti slavery movement avoided all slave made goods, or they tried to at least. Um, and this was not so, not just sugar, like in the UK, they also tried to avoid cotton, any products produced by slaves. And this is obviously a lot harder to do. Um, and it's more expensive than slave made goods, and it just it didn't catch on. So by the 1850s, you know, within 30 years, it's been reduced to a really small number of people that were doing this. Um, a small number of Quakers, kind of like a specific religious community that carried on that boycott, and lots of abolitionists had just given up on this tactic and moved towards more kind of institutional change. And obviously, again, causation is uncertain, but doesn't seem to play a big part in the eventual downfall of slavery in the US. The anti-abortion movement, um, there's some examples of some targeted boycotts against particular companies that seem to have worked quite well for anti-abortion activists. Um, there was a boycott of a company called the Updrawn Company that was probably a big part of why that company stopped doing research into anti-abortion, sorry, uh, stopped doing research into drugs that enabled people to have abortions. Um, and targeted protests against boycotts of particular companies also seems to have delayed the introduction of emergency contraception into the US, um, potentially for a decade or so. Uh, yeah, this was... I think the key difference here is that these boycotts are of all the products of a particular company. It's in animal advocacy, we're essentially, when we talk about veganism, we're encouraging people to boycott an entire product company, sorry, an entire product category um, for any company. But we don't say, so we wouldn't necessarily boycott a whole supermarket, we just not buy animal products from that supermarket. This is kind of taking the opposite approach of boycotting any product by a particular company um, in protest against a particular product that they're using. And you apply a lot of pressure to a particular company until they snap. And this has worked in a couple of examples for the anti-abortion movement. Um, yeah. There are, obviously the context is different. There are ways in which this could work, and I can think of examples of, this, of ways this could work. Say a company is about to introduce a new type of product, which is especially bad. You just, uh, you encourage people to just boycott the whole company, just not buy anything from them until they agree to the commitment. Um, so again, this suggests that we can that institutional change can be more tractable than just encouraging individuals to change their behaviour gradually and build change that way. Um, another example from the anti-genetically modified foods movement is that some of the success that the that movement had was through targeted institutional change. There have been some some boycotts of particular retailers, but also there was change at the EU regulation level. They essentially advocates focused on encouraging commitments from, com from countries that were already kind of quite against genetically modified foods to just put pressure onto the rest of the EU. And by kind of that, that institution focus was able to encourage a more hostile legal climate for genetically modified foods. And so that, all, that movement seems to have had some success through doing that. Again, this is a bit of a mixed example, but environmentalism Recycling has certainly had a really impressive reach in the sense that a huge number of people do recycle. Um, in the US, in, there was a 2014 survey which found that 96% of Americans recycle at least occasionally. But there are also some concerns about this kind of individual change. Um, one concern is that this uh, detracts resources from institutional solutions, which might be more effective overall. Uh, certainly if you read The Guardian, the UK newspaper, there's somebody called George Monbiot who m makes this point quite a lot, that this is distracted from institutional change which could be more effective. Um, there, 
there's also been evidence that it leads to what's called a moral licensing effect of where people have done their bit on a small scale and they feel like they don't need to do other things to address climate change or address the environmental problems. So there's actually been various, various studies which suggest this is a problem. So in one experiment, the presence of a recycling bin in a room actually increased the amount of paper towels that bathroom visitors used by about 16%. So it's kind of because they think, oh, I've recycled, so I can just use a whole load more towels. Um, it's this idea that encourages that kind of complacency. And yeah, again, obviously these, all these things are uncertain, but I feel like all these examples, each of them individually has slightly updated me a bit more to the idea that animal advocates should prioritise focusing on institutional change rather than individual change. Yeah. Okay, so on this, I just want to really hammer home this point about animal advocates needing to prioritise institutional change on the margin, so with like extra resources that we uh, get or if we're making strategic decisions. I've given you some historical evidence there, but I just want to point out that there is a whole load of other evidence which also supports this conclusion, which again summarised on our website and you can just check that out. There's some evidence from psychology. Um, so some experiments show example of what's called a backfire effect, which is essentially where you present people with new information, which goes against their existing position, and rather than moving towards the implications of the new, of the new evidence, they actually move away from it, and they kind of move towards their initial starting position. Um, yeah. So in contrast to this, there's also an example of a psychological effect called moral outrage, which is where people kind of project blame onto an institution. And this seems, if you kind of compare the implications of these two psychological effects, this kind of suggests that individual change is really hard uh, and institutional change might be a lot more tractable to achieve. There have also been various evaluations of individual change trying to get people to gradually, to individuals to change their diets. And this, it, it is doable, don't get me wrong, but it's expensive to do and it's hard, it requires a lot of time. Um, examples of evaluations include animal charity evaluators have done what's called a meta-analysis of leafleting um, and leafleting was found to be extremely expensive to actually achieve change. In fact, there, from this meta-analysis there was basically no evidence that it did cause any positive reduction in animal product consumption. There was, uh, they, was, they thought it was slightly more likely that it increased animal product consumption than decreased it although obviously there's various limitations of those kinds of studies. There's also been an interesting evaluation by a group called uh, Rethink Priorities, who have evaluated the cost effectiveness of 3D headsets uh, in encouraging dietary change. And again, this was found, this, well, actually this had stronger evidence that it did lead to some dietary change, but it worked out as being really expensive. It would have cost hundreds of dollars to actually get, essentially prevent one animal being born, raised in factory farm conditions. And if you compare this to other sorts of interventions, it doesn't necessarily look that promising for cost effectiveness, when we could think that all the institutional change that we could achieve in that time if we just applied targeted pressure to companies or, uh, or governments, that sort of thing. So yeah. Um, oh yeah, another important piece of evidence is that surveys suggest that people are much more supportive of... Is the microphone working? <laughs> people, uh, surveys suggest that uh, people are much more supportive of institutional change for animal advocacy issues than individual change. Sentience Institute, the organisation I work for, conducted a survey of Americans and we actually found that nearly 40, well, we found that 47% of people who had an opinion on the issue said that they would support a ban on factory farming. Um, a similar number said they would support a ban on slaughterhouses and a slightly lower number, about 33%, said that they would support a ban on animal farming overall. Now these figures are just impossible to imagine compared to the less than 5% of people in the US who are vegetarian or vegan. Um, people are willing to support these wider changes and that's, what that, that's how I interpret that survey. Okay, uh, yeah, I talked about this idea of, so I kind of hammered home that point about in, institution change just because I think everyone should <laughs> if your organisation isn't already thinking about institutional change, we'd really encourage people to engage seriously with that idea. Um, yeah, we've also conducted technology adoption case studies. We've got two out there at the moment, one on genetically modified foods, one on nuclear power. We've got a third one coming out soon on biofuels. And again, we can, we, the more of these we do, we'll start to see more and more kind of like correlations, consistent messages. One really interesting one is that technical uh, rebuttals of safety concerns there's some evidence from both of those movements that this has actually increased concern about, pro about the kind of like technology being suggested. Um, so to clarify, the reason why we're looking at these technology adoption case studies is because we're thinking about plant-based foods, we're thinking about 
uh, you know, you can think of Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger, how do we get those products to be successful? We're also thinking about cell-based meat, so that's meat grown from, uh, grown from animal cells but without requiring the slaughter of animals. And we're thinking about how we can make sure that these technologies are successful in replacing demand for animal products. Um, yeah, so there's been this kind of suggestion that technical, focusing on the technical problems and saying these aren't concerns actually increases people's concern. Um, so I'll just give you one example of this. Um, yeah, so there, in, in the US there was a report into, the US Atomic Energy Commission released a report into the, the kind of risks of nuclear power and they were trying to emphasize, look, the risks aren't that bad, but the media basically picks up their kind of worst case scenario estimate, um, which included a suggestion that in, in an accident 3,400 people might die and 40,000 people might be injured. And so although this was a technical report saying, look, the risks aren't so high, the newspapers picked up on those numbers and said, look how bad this problem might be. Um, so yeah, there's, there's also some evidence from genetically modified foods, as I suggested. So yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things I'm really trying to ram home from this talk. One is that, as I mentioned, this particular case that we've seen lots of evidence from on history about institutional change over individual change. But I think another one, another important message I'm trying to get across is that no one source of evidence is good enough. And we shouldn't be particularly confident in conclusions based on just one type of evidence. So obviously when we first approach a problem, we don't know very much about it, we rely on intuition. We rely on our gut feeling. What do we already know? What are our ideas? That sort of thing. But there are obviously lots of problems with this. There are various cognitive biases that people face. An example is something called the availability heuristic which is basically where something's particularly like close to the front of your brain because it's, you've heard about it recently or because it's especially memorable, then you'll focus on that piece of evidence and kind of you might ignore some other piece of, pieces of evidence that would be relevant. So that's one reason why intuition alone isn't enough. I've mentioned a couple of examples of kind of experiments conducted within the animal advocacy movement, and those are great, but they're also, they've also got their flaws. It's very hard to measure long-term or indirect outcomes. Um, yeah, so an example was, I mentioned the, the study from animal charity evaluators saying that leafleting, there's not much evidence, well, from that particular meta-analysis, there's no evidence that it causes any change. However, we do have anecdotal evidence from leaders in the animal advocacy movement that they have personally been influenced by leaflets. And so it seems silly to suggest that this never works. Obviously, there are examples where it has worked. And so experiments are useful, but limited. And yeah, obviously, the focus of this presentation has been on history, and it's one type of evidence. It's got its strengths. It can give a broad insight into lots of different questions that we're focusing on, lots of these different foundational questions. Um, yeah, it can also give a single case study, can give insight into lots of different issues. Oops. But it's, again, it's limited. I've talked lots about the problems of inferring causation, uh, problems of random chance, all those sorts, sorts of issues. And so I'm just trying to make the point that we can use history and we should use history, but we shouldn't rely on it too much. And I just want to really emphasize, it's so crucial we use all available types of evidence because when we make these decisions, we're making decisions that affect the lives of animals and we're affecting uh, those we're trying to advocate for. And so, yeah, we need to use all available evidence to make sure that we're the best advocates that we can be and we do the uh, have the most positive impacts that we can. And yeah, that's it, thank you very much. That's my email, have to take any questions we've got time for, thank you. <laughs> So we have time for uh, about four questions. Uh, um, now you can um, uh, ask for anything, and you you have to speak loudly because we have, have only this microphone. So you were the first one, so you can <laughs> you can ask. Uh, thanks for the talk, Jamie. Um, so um, one thing I took off from your talk was that. Um, it seems that boycott to actually be effective if it's sort of limited enough and very like targeted well enough. Um, so, do you have any ideas how we might want to sort of make our current boycott uh, more targeted? So, could it be that what you're saying implies something like um, maybe going from veganism to I don't know, boycotting fur or something like that. Uh, 
this might be useful move to. Okay, so I wouldn't. Um, yeah, I'd kind of think about the implications for particular campaigns. I don't want to suggest that we shouldn't have any kind of generalized boycott. I think it's useful to have veganism, vegetarianism as one ask that we can make of individuals who want to make positive change around us. Um, I think in terms of specific examples, it's about applying the pressure to particular companies or particular institutions to make that change, right? So say you're targeting a particular company because they've got uh, insufficient like, welfare or whatever. Um, it suggests that that sort of protest might achieve more concrete outcomes. So I guess in the sense that Open Cages, the Humane League, were already doing those kinds of interventions. This is just another piece of evidence to suggest that sort of thing has worked and may continue to work. And an example of where, I haven't thought a lot about this because I don't know the specifics, but an example of where I can think of boycotting a particular company for a new product they're introducing might be, uh, there's been some kind of, there have been various moves to introduce factory farming octopuses. And octopuses are like, uh, we have higher evidence of their sentience than other forms of invertebrates, I believe. And so this is an example where a company tries to introduce like factory farmed octopus, and we could say that's completely off limits, you can't do that. And so we're just going to boycott everything that that, company try everything that that company sells, and you try and encourage a generalised boycott of that company until they just promise that they just won't sell factory farmed octopus. An example. You talked about the moral licensing. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how strong the evidence is. Uh, is there anything regarding uh, consuming through animal products? Is that results in moral licensing? Yeah, I actually don't know a huge amount of, about it, I'm afraid. Um, my impression is more that there's various evidence from different contexts that this can happen. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure of anything that's been applied to them specifically to animal advocacy. So for me, it's more of a kind of like theoretical concern in the back of my mind rather than something that I could say, you know, X amount of this action leads to <laughs> Y moral licensing effect. Um, it's, it's something that, you know, I think psychologists could look into. It's probably not something that I would like prioritize as my next research, but it would definitely be interesting to find that more specific on that. Can we have a definition of moral licensing? Okay, um, so moral licensing, Apologies to any psychologists in the room, I'm butchering this. <laughs> um, I think of it in terms of like, you feel kind of licensed to do something which is either immoral or just less moral than you otherwise, otherwise would have done. So it's because you've taken a particular action or espoused a particular view, that you feel it's acceptable to do something else. And this is, this is assumed to be a kind of like subconscious process rather than something that somebody decides like, Yes, I've done this good thing, therefore I'll do this bad thing. I don't think most people think like that, but um, it's that kind of indirect effect. The, I should say there's kind of an alternative theoretical explanation of where people have this moral consistency effect, which is where they've done a certain thing and they feel they should be consistent in their behaviour. So there's actually kind of like a theoretical alternative to that problem. So again, this, I, we, this is not something we're particularly confident in. It's like a, um, yeah, will more, more definitely occur in all contexts. Uh, I'm also coming to the question. Um, you talked about how, in your conclusions from the absolute origin work you've done, how you're kind of more and less confident on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you've considered trying to put like your size confidence in or something, and do you think that would be a useful thing to do? Um, well, so there's kind of two layers of this, right? There's the layer of how confident am I that that happens in the anti abortion movement? and how confident am I that that would then transfer to the farmed animal context. Um, I'd be more happy about putting your confidence into it on the first part than the second part, because there's lots of different kinds of inferences you could make from that particular process having occurred. Um, I haven't done that. I, I do think there's a concern when people use various forms of numbers that people will like latch on to the numbers and go, look, there's an 80% chance that if we do this, then it'll have this effect, which I don't want to suggest, I don't want people to kind of take that out of context. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a strong view about whether that's a good or bad idea. <laughs> but I, def, I don't think I'd do it about the second part of that process, about how confident I was it would apply to the farm that context. Yeah. Um, there's a <clears throat> I was wondering um, if you have any advice on uh, how individuals or small organizations can, um, can uh, 
get started working uh, with uh, making an uh, institutional change because if you don't have so many uh, resources and if you are actually volunteers, then how can we be making an yeah, well, I'll, I'll start with a, a caveat. I'm probably not the best person to ask that question for because we think about these like strategic questions rather than the like concrete what animal advocates should do in particular circumstances. So you'll probably get a much more useful answer from asking anybody over the page <laughs> than you would from asking me. Okay. Um, I do, yeah, I, I would just suggest that that there are existing groups that are doing this kind of thing. They have lots of experience. There's some evidence about what does doesn't work. You can ask those people who ask those. Uh, for their tips, especially if you, I don't know if you were to talk by Laura and Andre earlier today about training advocates on those sorts of uh, issues, and they've built up a lot of resources. So there's definitely some more concrete stuff than <laughs> what I was talking about, but that sort of thing. Okay, so we are out of time, so um, we have to finish. So thank you very much once again for the lecture.